Hello, statisticians here with the first lesson of the Z inference procedures. Uh, this is really our first uh, statistical inference unit of the year. Um, so we'll be introducing some things around um, confidence intervals and significance tests, uh, which are, are two of our biggest concepts for the year. Um, these follow in line with the idea of, of sampling distributions. Um, you're going to see some overlap and some formulas here, um, but the procedure itself is going to be that uh, the big part here. So, so we'll focus on that through this this video. So the things you're going to want to know here um, by the end of this video are the four steps for a confidence interval, and it's really kind of three plus steps. Um, it's not necessarily that, uh, that there's a first step that's not mandatory, but that I like and I'll talk about here. Um, and so it's three plus steps of the confidence interval. It is a true four steps of the, um, sorry, it is a true four steps to the to the significance test. Um, and then we're gonna end with a little bit of the idea of calculating a sample size based on a margin of error. And this is kind of like a, a TV station wants to put up a poll on the TV and they want it to say 3% margin of error. And we'll talk about how how they uh, determine how many people they need to ask or to poll in order to, to put that 3% margin of error up on the screen. So our new X bar in this, this lesson is P hat. Um, so what what is the X bar is the sample mean. Sorry, the program is acting up on me a little bit here. Now P hat is the sample proportion. Okay, and so what we will work with here is a lot of the P hat, which I referenced in the sampling distribution unit as well. So here's an example, and this example will kind of drive us through the rest of this lesson. Uh, for a study on historically good television, Mr. Ludvigson is interested in estimating the percent of Minnetonka High School students who have watched at least one episode of The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. To help him solve this lifelong question, he randomly samples 60 MHS students. So randomly sample 60 MHS students. That's going to be a big one for us here. Uh, and 24 of the 60 students admit to watching at least one episode. So there's our P hat is 24 out of 60. Okay, so 24 out of 60, you divide by six on each side, gives you four out of 10 or 0 0.40. So about 40% of students in this sample uh, admitted to watching the Bachelor or the Bachelorette. Now, here's the idea with this, though. He wants to estimate the percent of Minnetonka high school students, of which there are about 3,200 in our building. Okay, but he uses a sample of size 60. So obviously, he hasn't talked to the other 3,140 students here, but what he is going to do is he is going to use a procedure called a confidence interval. And the confidence interval is going to give us, in the end, an interval of values, a range of values that we are a certain percent confident will actually contain the true population proportion. So that means we are using a P hat to try to estimate P, okay? Um, this is a, a method that's a, it's a very statistically educated guess at what P would be. Um, it's it's going to be uh, as long as the procedure is done fairly and honestly um, and and statistically sound, it's going to be a very good estimate typically. And um, it's uh, it's a process of not having to ask everybody because obviously it'd be very time consuming and expensive to talk to all 3,200 students. So we're going to talk to 60, which would be much quicker, more efficient, and then we're going to make an estimate about the 3,200 which is exactly what political polling does. They don't ask everybody who's gonna vote, they ask a, a number of folks who are gonna vote, and then they put something up on the screen. So here we go. So the first step, and this is kind of the optional step, is to defi define the parameter of interest. And so this is where we just give our thesis statement. So you picture this being published in a newspaper or a journal, and we are gonna give our, our thesis statement of what we are gonna estimate with this interval. And you can see here, it's estimating the true proportion of the population that fulfills some outlined success. So in our situation here, we are going to estimate the true 
proportion of MHS students who have watched at least one episode of The Bachelor or Bachelorette. So that's our thesis statement. That's what the work to follow is going to be, be accomplishing. Okay, so after we kind of establish what we want to do, we have to show that our work is going to be valid. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to define the, the process, which for us here is going to be a one proportion Z interval. One proportion because it's just one sample. And the Z has to do with the, the standard error that we're using, um, which we can get into more in class. Um, it cut off our, our conditions here, but we have two major conditions. Um, the SRS, which is generally stated in the question, and you just need to quote the statement um, from, the, from the problem. Okay, so the question, this, in this problem, it said a random sample of 60, so you would quote that. The second is the large enough sample condition. And if you recall from last unit, the large enough sample condition is going to be n times p. But unfortunately, we don't have a p yet. We only have a p hat, so we're going to use n times p hat instead because we don't know what p is here yet because we're trying to figure that out with our confidence interval. So those are our two main conditions. You'll every once in a while see a third condition that looks like this. And what this is saying is that uh, the individuals within our samples are independent of each other. Um, and, and what it really means is we're taking such a small portion of all the students that there's no way we're going to take some full group of friends who have watch parties together each week um, because we're taking less than 10% of our total student body. So to actually verify these conditions, one, SRS. Here I would just say question states, quote, a random sample, and don't abbreviate RS like that just to save some time here, random sample of 60 MHS students. So one condition down. Second condition, is it a large enough sample? And so in this condition, we would take our n, which is 60, and multiply it by our p hat, which was 40, okay, because the p hat was 24 out of 60, okay? And we take that and that we multiply that, and 60% times the 0.4 is going to be right back at 24 again, okay? And that means we had 24, quote, successes, which is somebody who watched The Bachelor, The Bachelor at least once. And then our fails would be the 60 times one minus that. So these are the people who didn't watch. And of course, some people might argue that that's not a fail, but, but in this context, it's a fail. So these are both at least 10. So we, are, we have uh, collected a large enough sample for this work to be valid. And we would then say that the central limit theorem will ensure a roughly normal sampling distribution. Okay, again, that's why we're checking that. Now, that third condition here, which you don't necessarily have to include, is just 10 times n, which is 10 times 60, so that's 600. That is less than the number of students in our school. So in other words here, if we had all the names in a bucket, since we're only picking 60, yes, we aren't putting them back. So technically, there's um, an independence issue there because we aren't replacing, um, which we'll get to more in the probability unit. But um, since we're taking sm such a small portion, it allows us to avoid a statistical corrector, um, which we won't get into here, but um, it allows us to, uh, to run this, uh, presuming that the individuals are independent. So I um, already spent too much time on that right now, but that's just a third optional condition for now. Um, you'll see it periodically in other questions. And so it's just good to know that it's there. Um, and again, that has to do with independence. Okay. Step three is the actual mechanics. So this is the formula here to determine or to calculate a one proportion Z confidence interval. Now, this is the critical value here, the Z star, 
and this is the standard error. And that product of those two is what's called the margin of error. Okay, the margin of error is what you see on TV. When you see on the bottom of a poll at the bottom, it says MOE is plus or minus 3% or something. This is referring to exactly that. Now, for our purposes, um, if we define the, sorry, if we define the, uh, the type of procedure in step two, when we said it was a one proportion Z interval, we can actually get away without really showing work here, but I am going to show work um, for right now just to give us some context of how to do this. So again, our formula was P hat plus or minus Z star times P hat one minus P hat over N. So the P hat again was 40%. The Z star um, for a 95% confidence interval, Z star is 1.96. So um, that we can talk more about getting it from the chart or from your calculator through an inverse norm function. Um, if you type in uh, in uh, second bars and you go to inverse norm and put in 0.975, which would be the right bound of this confidence interval, um, we can talk about that more in class, but that would give you the 1.96. So P at is 0.4, 1 minus 0.4, and our sample size was 60. Now you could go ahead and calculate this the old fashioned way, but there is a way on your calculator. Um, if you go to stat tests, and this is a one proportion Z interval, which on mine is actually a one proportion Z interval. And when I go in there, it's gonna ask what X is. X is my numerator, which was 24. It's going to ask what n is. n is my denominator, which was 60. Now, keep in mind, I just typed in my fraction for my p hat. I didn't type in any percent. I didn't type in 0.4 anywhere. My confidence level is going to be 0.95, and I'm going to calculate. And it gives me here, then, a final interval of 0 0.2760 to 0 0.5240. So... That is our confidence interval. So what we're looking at here then is the range of percentages of what percent of Minnetonka High School students may have watched at least one episode of The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. Obviously, this is a very wide range here, um, but that's because our sample size was only 60. So we can talk about what that means in uh, detail here. Here's the general format for a, an interpretation of an interval. We are blank percent confident, which of course in this one and typically is 95, that our interval, um, which was that 27 to 52 percent, contains the true proportion of, in this case, Minnetonka High School students who have seen at least one episode of The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. So I'll just write that quickly here. We are 95 percent confident that our interval which ran from 0.2760 to 0 0.5240, contains the true proportion of MHS students who have seen at least one episode of the bachelor or bachelorette okay so um you can even see our margin of error here if you take 40 it was right in the middle um in here so that means our margin of error was about 12.4 percent so we took 40 percent plus or minus 0.124 uh, sorry um and that was our margin of error, but again, we we're really just interested in this case in the actual interval. So, so we are 95% confident that somewhere between 27.6 and 52.4% of Minnetonka students have seen at least one episode. Again, pretty wide interval there. That's not very precise, and that has to do with our sample size. Okay, so that's an interval. An interval, again, we just took the sample and we used it to create an estimate about the population. Okay, and why do we do this? Well, 
we didn't want to ask 3,200 students if they've seen The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. So we asked 60, and we came back with a rough uh, estimate of what percent of students have seen it. Now, the other side is actually running a test. And a test is where we establish up front some hypothesis. So before we even started this, Mr. Ludvigson might have said, I contend that 50% of students have seen um, at least one episode of The Bachelor, The Bachelorette. And you as a student come along and say, no, 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 no. It's less than 60 or less than 50%. So in that case, your hypotheses, the null hypothesis is the sort of original belief. And the original belief was that it was 50%. The alternative here was that it was something less than 50. Now you noticed on that last slide, it could be less than, greater than, or not equal to. Now the not equal to presents a little different element because it's it, uh, it goes in both directions naturally. And we'll talk about that more later. So we have less than here. In terms of our conditions, uh, first of all, the type is a one proportion Z test now instead of a one proportion Z interval. So that's the only difference here. And it is important to be able to name them because that can get you out of showing some work. Um, our conditions are the same. The difference here with our large enough sample condition is now we do have a P. It's actually a P naught because it's our null hypothesis value, which was 50%. So we're going to use that instead of the P hat because for now, the null hypothesis we believe is the most accurate value until we reject it or, or prove it wrong. And then the third condition is that 10 is less than capital N or independence. Okay. So to verify the conditions, I won't rewrite the whole thing here, but SRS is the same. That's going to be the whole, uh, the question states, and then we quote the question, large enough sample. In this case, we had still a sample size of 60. If it was truly 50-50, um, like our hypothesis states, that means we would have had 30 people who said yes and 30 people who said no, which are both greater than or equal to 10. So again, central limit theorem ensures the roughly normal. And then there's that third condition of independence that I won't talk about again here. Um, that's optional. Okay, so the actual test mechanics here, the P hat again is our 24 out of 60. Okay, so this is like last unit, we saw this formula. The P naught is the null hypothesis. Okay, so that's the 50%, this is the 40%, and N is still 60. Sorry, this is just showing that P hat is the sample proportion, and then P naught is the hypothesized proportion. So, to calculate here, to calculate our Z, or how many standard deviations our sample was from the population, which is going to help us determine the likelihood that it was actually 50% to begin with, would be 0 0.40 minus 0 0.50 over 0.5 times 1 minus 0.5, and the sample size was 60. Um, now, again, you could calculate that the old-fashioned way, or you can go back to stat tests, and then the fifth one on mine is one proportion Z test. You do have to be careful. It's not just Z test, which is on, which is the first one on there. It's one proportion Z test. Okay. And it's going to ask you here for P naught. So P naught is 0 0.5. It's going to ask you for X and N. And if you already typed it into your interval, it actually already fills it in for you. But that's 24 and 60 again. And it's going to ask you for your alternative hypothesis. Again, our alternative hypothesis was that P was less than 50. So you'll do the less than P naught because this is actually the 50. So that's the middle one of the three, less than P naught. And then we calculate. Now, here's what's happening. Your calculator now is going to give you a Z score, which in this case is negative 1.55. Now keep in mind, Z score on that normal curve. On the normal curve, the center here is 
50% or a z-score of zero. We got a z-score here of negative 1.55, which means that's where 40% is. Okay, again, it's just the conversion. 50% was the p, and that's at the at zero standard deviations from the mean. We got a sample of 40, which this shows us is 1.55 standard deviations below the mean. So a standard deviation here must have been um, about seven or so, uh, six and a half to seven, because we ended up about one and a half of those below the mean. Um, uh, or I guess, let's see, yeah, six and a half. Um, now, the alternative is less than, so what we are going to do is the calculator is also going to give you a value called a p-value. And we'll talk more about the definition of a p-value, but what it really is, is the likelihood of us getting the result that we got, assuming the null is true. So in other words, in this problem, the p-value was 0 0.0607 which is this area right here, 0 0.0607, which means if 50% is correct, if 50% of the Minnetonka High School uh, population have watched The Bachelor or The Bachelorette, the chances we would get a sample of 40 or less is about 6%. So if we ran 100 samples, we would expect about six of the 100 samples to produce this low of a percent or lower, 40% or lower, assuming the 50% is true, which is the key here. Okay, so we're assuming the 50% is the center of the curve. And if it is, the chances we would have gotten 40% or less are about 6%. So now we talked a little bit last unit about when we get a low p-value, what is it? Well, in this case, we would say this is low. It's pretty low. It's pretty, pretty strong evidence that it might be less than 50% of students who watch it. However, we actually use 0.05 as our threshold. So in this case, we did not get low enough to really reject it. Now you can change your threshold, but we're gonna use 0.05 and that's where we get our conclusion. So here's, here's the conclusion. Again, it, I don't know why this is, is producing a different uh, font size here, but what we would say in our conclusion, so I'm gonna write to the actual conclusion, is this, based on our evidence. And our evidence was a p-value of about 0 0.0606 was uh, not less than, actually we'll use just less than 0.05, was not less than 0.05. Okay, so I'm gonna write it and then we'll talk about it. We fail to reject the null hypothesis. So there is not significant evidence to show that less than 50%, which is our hypothesis, that less than 50% of MHS students have seen an episode of The Bachelor or The Bachelorette, okay? So what that is referring to now here is you think about a courtroom. If there's a 6% chance that somebody's innocent, we're probably not gonna reject their innocence and find them guilty. In this case, we're saying that it's there is some evidence here that it's perhaps less than 50%, but it's not quite strong enough evidence. And what we use is this 0 0.05 threshold. If something were to happen that, should be, that would be a less than 5% chance of happening, we might say, okay, this is kind of weird. We got a value that was so low that it would happen, say, 2% of the time. Maybe we were wrong to begin with, okay? So if it was something like, let's say we got 20% of students who watched The Bachelor and it ended up being a p-value of 0 0.0000002, in that situation, we'd say, okay, this is just way too unlikely for us to only get 20%. What's happening here is the 50% was probably just wrong. Now, the other frustrating thing is some folks don't like the language fail to reject. 
But again, this is one sample, and our one sample didn't do enough to say that it was less than 50. So we will talk a lot more about this in, in class, but fail to reject just occurs here because we didn't get below 0.05. So we do not have the significant statistical evidence to say that less than 50% of students see the have seen the bachelor bachelorette. Might it be? Probably, but we don't have the evidence here to conclude that for certain. So, um, so for right now, we're going to leave them innocent and say that it is 50%. Or at least that we haven't proven that it's different than 50% yet or less than 50. Okay, so that's the conclusion. Now, the very last thing here is just a really quick look at going kind of the other way. So let's say that a producer of a, of a show says, I want to be 95% confident and have a margin of error of plus or minus 3%. There is a formula here that allows us to then calculate how many people we would need to ask or poll in order for this to be true. Now, the M in this formula is the margin of error. So that's the 3%. If you recall, the Z star for 95% is 1.96. Okay. And as if you haven't seen enough P's already between P hat, P not, P, the proportion P, um, or even a p-value, which is a, something different altogether, um, what we are going to do here is use a p-star. Now, p-star means basically we haven't collected anything yet. We don't have anything. We don't have any idea what proportion of people are going to vote for this candidate. So for p-star, we just put in 0.5. That's the most conservative way of doing it. It's just assuming everything's even. Okay. Um, this will give us the biggest possible n. If we move off of that 0.5 at all, that end's going to get smaller, and we might not ask enough people. So we can't assume somebody's going to get 85% of the vote, and that would just mean we have to ask less people because it would become clear sooner that that person's going to win. It's kind of like when they call an election um, early in the evening versus after all the votes have been tallied. So P star is 0.5. We put in 1 minus 0.5, and we are trying to solve for N. So this is the process here. And we are going to do the algebra to solve for n. Now, I'm going to do that actually here on the next slide. I'll actually do a calculation. So here's an example. We're at 99% confidence, okay, and a 3% margin of error. Okay, in this particular problem, our margin of error then is 0.03. Okay, 0.03 equals... Okay, the Z star for 99% is actually 2.58 roughly, or 575, we'll say 2.58. And then this is 0.5, 1 minus 0.5, and N. Now it's just algebra. Okay, so really quickly, what we'll do for the algebra is we're going to split the root. And that puts the root n in the denominator. So I just split the root, just a, a simple rad, uh, square root rule there. And I'm just going to move the fraction bar over so that's all in the numerator. So that leads to us having uh, 0.03 equals, and again, 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25. But when you square root that, it goes right back to 0.5. So this is actually 2.58 times 0.5 over, and again, it's still root n. Okay, so 2.58 times 0.5 is going to be one, um, 1.29. Now, a little algebra trick here would be to just swap the root n and the 0.03, but to do that, actually what you're doing is you're multiplying both sides by root n, and then dividing both sides by 0.03. So that means root n equals 1.29 divided by 0.03, okay, and 1.29 divided by 0.03 is about 43. So root n equals 43. Well, of course, we don't want root n. We want n, so we have to square both sides. And so 43 squared gives you about 1849. And again, if it were a decimal, you always have to round up here because if you round down, that means you're going to ask too few people. So 
in this case it's 1849 and we need to sorry 1849 and we need to ask at least that many people so really we're asking greater than or equal to 1849 and if once we reach that and we've asked we've pulled that many people who are you going to vote for whatever it happens to be then we know that we have gotten the 99% confidence and a 3% margin of error and we can put that on our TV screen they don't put the confidence level, but that's something that they would know in the background, but they would put the margin of error up there. So that is a, a way of working from the confidence level and margin of error back to the sample size. Thank you for sticking with me through all that. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, please let me know.